Hey there friends, welcome back to the channel. My name's Alex Lokes and today we're going to be doing a brief rundown of what 120 film is and some common misconceptions about it within the modern social media sphere. So let's take a seat and we can get into it. So what we know today as 120 film has become a bit misconstrued within the realm of social media. A couple years ago, um, several film bloggers recognized that people were putting the hashtag 120 millimeter film onto their images shot on what we refer to today as 120 film. And to be perfectly fair, even though it's wrong, I can kind of see where they're coming from. And that's simply because everyone's normal film that they recognize is called 35 millimeter. So it only makes sense that the next step up would be 120 millimeters. The problem is 120 millimeters is about 12 centimeters in size. And by that point, you're starting to get into large format sheet film territory. And there is actually a nine by 12 sheet size. It's not incredibly popular, but it is still available. I believe FOMA makes it. 120 film kind of sits between the 35 millimeter and your larger sheet film formats. And the 120 isn't actually indicative of the size of the film. 35 millimeter is better known, is, is the best known name for that format, for miniature format. And the standard um, created by Kodak is 135. So if you figured out where I'm going with this, gold star, you go to the head of the class. So where did this 120 number come from? Well, for that, we need to go a bit back in time. So as I said before, to get back to where the 120 number came from, we need to go back to Eastman. George Eastman, in fact, the man who really started to bring photography into the public sphere to democratize it, make it available to the ordinary person. The first camera, the Kodak, is where they get the idea of you push the button, we do the rest. You could buy a Kodak camera, shoot a hundred frames, send it to Rochester, they would process, send you the prints and a freshly loaded camera with another hundred shots. Well, the problem is, is that people wanted to take more control in, the, in what they were doing with their photography. So in the year 1895, Kodak filed a patent for a flexible roll film that was transported between one spool to another with a paper backing. And he promptly called the format 101. For 120 film, we need to skip ahead 19 formats and six years later with the release of the number two brownie. And the number two brownie included a new film type, 120 film. Again, it used the same idea as all other roll film formats of this particular group of films with a spool, originally wooden core with metal flanges, moving to all metal and then eventually plastic as it stands today. That measured 62 millimeters in width and produced an image that was 60 millimeters wide and 90 millimeters tall or as we know it today, six by nine. This was the original frame size for the camera and the large size was there for two particular reasons. One, it would allow labs to contact print these negatives and you'd immediately get a six centimeter by nine centimeter print compensated for the single element meniscus lenses that were in these basic snapshot cameras 120 film was designed as the consumer film stock in a day age where 
professional photographers were still working with larger formats, mainly plates and flexible sheet film. Modern 120 film conforms to a certain ISO standard. Now, when I explained the original patent for 120 film, I indicated that the width was 62 millimeters. These days it's closer to 61 millimeters, allowing you still to have that six, 60 millimeter, six centimeter frame width with about a half millimeter on either side as the film rebate. So I have here a sacrificial roll of Svema FN64. Now this is original stock Svema out of the Kiev factory in Ukraine. And this one expired in 1993. So it was produced in a liberated non-Soviet controlled Ukraine. And the thing is that this, I've, I've batch tested this particular pack of film and there are certain problems with it. So I'm going to be able to sacrifice this roll and not feel bad. It's not like I'm tearing up a roll of 120 Portra 400. So once we open up the box, the film itself is wrapped in foil. And here we go. Here is a roll of Svema FN64 from the Ukraine. And when you get these films fresh from the factory, they come wrapped up with usually a paper tape that is easily removed. This being post-Soviet Eastern European, um, it feels like actual masking tape. And it's, on most films, it's quite easy to remove, but if not, I always make sure I carry one of these on me. You can simply slice it open. And now I don't recommend doing what I'm doing here in the light because you will ruin your film. But this is again, just for demonstration purposes. So the first bit you see here, this is the paper backing. And there is quite a bit before you actually get to where the flexible film is taped to that backing paper. Here's your plastic core. Now there's various different shapes and styles. Uh, my personal favorite are the Fuji ones that have the little notch in there and the uh, hole in the end that you can latch it onto. Um, having a couple of these spares is always a good idea, especially if you're buying used uh, medium format cameras, you never know when they're not going to come with one of these. So having a couple spares laying around is always a good idea. One thing you will notice on the backing paper is that they still have numbers on them. This is for red window advances where you manually have to advance the film to the next frame and there's a little red window. And the reason the window is red is because a lot of the early films were orthochromatic and couldn't see red light. So by filtering it, it somewhat protects the film from light and prevents light from leaking through your backing paper. It works with panchromatic film, but if you're concerned, just put a little piece of tape over it and flip it aside. Some cameras actually have a little um, blocking piece that will prevent light from getting in there, which is always a great idea. So here you have your film itself. It is not taped down on one side, and uh, so it will hang loose. But as you advance it actually, because it's pressed tightly against the camera itself, it won't actually fail. Um, the one thing you do have to worry about, especially when buying expired film, is that there's contamination from the backing paper. Backing paper is, was a, is still a very difficult piece of technology to do. And most North American, um, Kodak or Western power, um, films have particularly good backing paper. You see a lot more contamination with those made in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet bloc. Another thing to watch out for is um, failure of the tape. Um, I've had a couple of rolls of uh, ancient Agfa and even older Ilford films that the tape has failed and it just comes loose as soon as you start advancing it into the camera. Um, again, that adhesive product is incredibly, is an incredible piece of technology 
that it's lasted as long as it did, but everything comes to a failure at some point. Of course, the problem with a 6x9 image is that you only end up getting 8 shots on a roll. And more frugal-minded photographers wanted to get a little bit more out of the cost of a roll of film. So Kodak started producing a half-frame version of their new 120 cameras, which resulted in a much more familiar 6 by 4.5 centimeter frame size. We call it today 645. And by that point, the revolution was rolling. You could get cameras produced that produced that made images of almost any size because like any flexible film, you could just expose how much or how little you wanted. You were only limited by the camera itself. So we already know about the two main formats, the two main image sizes that 120 film and 120 cameras could produce. And soon tons of other formats were hitting the market. One of the most iconic is 6x6, and that started when um, Frank and Heideke started producing the Roloflex TLRs, twin lens reflex cameras. And, and eventually you got into 6x7 cameras. And 6x7 is great because if you want to make 8x10 enlargements, you're already at the correct ratio, which is amazing. And once you get past 6x7, you have even more. You have 6x8. Again, 6x9 is still quite popular um, within the photography world. You can even go wider. You got 6x12 and even a massive 6x17 negative. Of course, the bigger your frame size, the less images per roll. And again, that all depends on the camera. At the 645 level, you get either 16 or 15 frames, depending on the camera. 6x6, six six, you're down to 12. 6x7, six 6x8, six you're within the 10 and 9 size um, frames per roll. 6x8, six you're at 8 frames. And then it just goes down from there. And when it comes to cameras, you have a ton of options available to you today. A lot of older box cameras are still being are still serviceable and uh, useful if you really want to get that classic single element lens look. The oldest camera in my collection is a 1915 Toronto built Kodak Hawkeye Model C. And yeah, it still works. I still take it out and shoot photos on it. But you can go from there. You have zone focus folders. You got folders that are range finders. You've got traditional range finders as well that look like a oversized Leica. You have SLRs that look like your 35 millimeter SLRs. You've got SLRs that look like boxes that can shoot. You've got SLRs that are basically medium format point and shoot cameras. You have studio cameras. Um, twin lens reflexes, and not to mention a ton of toy cameras make use of 120 film. The possibilities are endless and you can get cameras as cheap as you like or as expensive as you like. Pinholes, homemade cameras, you name it, it is completely possible. 120 is probably the easiest film format that you can actually go out and build your own camera, either out of physical material or 3D printing. And again, like I said, pinholes, you don't even need to have a lens to make 120 film look good. It's just an incredibly flexible format, and it is one that I will always tend to gravitate towards when I want to have more quality images than quantity. Now, when it comes to 120 film, there are a couple of variants to it. And it should be noted that these variants hold very similar ties to 120 film, but are both slightly different. The first one worth mentioning is 620 film. 620 film was released by Kodak in the 1930s 
as an effort to recorner that photographic market. You see, a lot of companies picked up on 120 film and began producing it themselves. Companies like Agfa and Ilford and eventually Fuji when it hit the, hit the film market. So 620 film is basically the exact same film as 120. It's just spooled onto a thinner core and different size keyholes in the flanges. The second one worth noting is 220 film. And 220 film, as the name implies, has twice the length and lacks the paper backing across the entire, the entire length of the film. So it will basically double your shots. So a six by nine frame count of eight suddenly becomes 16 in 220 format. So 120 film is still quite readily available today. Despite being released in 1901, it is the oldest continuously produced film stock that has changed very little over the years. And major producers like Fuji, Kodak, and Ilford, along with FOMA, all produce 120 film in vast quantities and in multiple types. You have your traditional black and white film, you have color negative, and of course, E6 color slide. And the cameras themselves are still really good. The problem is a lot of them carry a premium price. I'm of course talking about Hasselblad and Roloflex cameras, although you can find deals on some of those. My personal favorite include my Mamiya M645, my Roloflex 2.8F, and my Holga 120. But I also have a ton of box cameras from the early 20th century, including my Opa Ostuk's Agfa Box 50, which was gifted to him by his company when he emigrated to Canada following the Second World War. Well, that covers it for this video. I hope you've enjoyed this journey into what 120 film is. And I'll leave you with one final note. If you do come across the average photographer, especially someone new to film photography, using the term 120 millimeter film, don't call them out publicly. If you know them personally or follow them on Instagram, or Twitter or something, send them a private message and quietly correct them. We need less keyboard warriors, more helpful people within social media, both in Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. But let me know in the comments, what has been your experience with 120 film? What are your favorite frame sizes? Like I've mentioned, mine are six by six and six by four and a half, 645. They are always my go-to. It's a great balance between number of frames and interesting compositions, and of course, interesting cameras. If you're new to the channel and like what you see, give me a thumbs up, and if you haven't subscribed, click that subscribe button and the bell notification icon. I produce content once or twice a month. And until next time, get out there, stay safe, make something awesome happen.